Okay, this is should be the third increment from the beginning of the new Matthew 24-25 meter. I have given you the overview, which was the introduction, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. The previous increment was to play out with Genesis and Psalm 90. How a kid will learn that. Oh, Daddy, that's 63 sevens since Israel was enslaved. See, because they would have remembered their history. They would have taught it to their kids. And talk to any Jew today. There's the most important thing that you're supposed to do, and of course the command to do it's in Deuteronomy 6 and 30. So, how did the kids learn? Well, we have the text to show it. Now, I'm not going to go through all the, you know, details on how I learned that this is what it is. But it's the same number in Psalm 90, and both of the passages talk back to each other, as I tried to explain in previous increment. What I'm going to focus on here is something that's going to be a lot more obvious and kind of like shocking. Remember I said this is a dateline, 63. And that represents 63 7 since Israel's slavery as a dateline for when Moses is writing. He's literally writing 441 years after Israel's slavery, but the slavery is not contiguous. It's 390 years of slavery proper, okay, plus 40 years that he's actually the actual date of his writing. But they add on the extra 10 years for Joseph so that you're counting. And that's cute because it ties back to how many years since Israel was effectively enslaved at the time that Moses is writing. It's, it's a, there's this thing that this kind of meter does which we call equidistance. Moses is writing at a time that's equidistant from X. And we're going to find out what X is by the time we get to the end of this chapter. So he's setting that up by doing the 63 here. The second date line is 119, which is how old Moses is when he writes this Genesis. That's also how old he is when he writes Psalm 90, which I showed in the last increment or just explained. What I want to focus on here, though, is how the story ends. You'll notice that he's going backwards in time. 63 seven since Israel's slavery. He's 119. That's backwards in time. Even as he's going forward in the text. Okay? 210 years after Noah's death, 490 had happened. This is this, this stuff all related. Because remember, Noah was the guy of the flood. And in Hebrew, the 1-1 one, one here, that's a title. The first verse in Hebrew, you know, the, the Jews would have learned it that way. They would have learned this as their first verse. Okay? And it's really cleverly matched. Because this, okay, is, um, and God said, be light. Okay? Is that, yeah, or... Yeah, I'm, I'm, my eyes are starting to go, so I don't see as well as I used to. i got to get surgery for that. So, light. When Israel saw the light, when she came out into the light after being in the darkness of slavery. And then the other cute thing here is evening, morning, one day, the first day. See, first day. Yeah, when Moses' first day was 119 years prior. See, it's that kind of wit, all right, that's really necessary to see the wit that goes with the numbers so that when you see other numbers, you can start to say, oh, okay, what's the witty meaning of these numbers? And oftentimes the wit is sarcasm. Okay? So he's establishing, and this is something you can check with any Bible scholar, the book of Genesis establishes all of the text that will be in the rest of the Bible. All of the literary styles, all of the themes, 
That's one of the first things that you learn. Well, I don't know if it's one of the first things you learn in seminary. But one of the things you learn in seminary, like my pastor did and as he told us, one of the things you learn in seminary is the book of Genesis is where all, it's like the seed of the rest of the Bible. So every other Bible book after Genesis, has you have to be able to trace it back to Genesis or you do not have the right interpretation of the passage. The Bible is consistent. If God really wrote it, the Bible is consistent and everything fits. Okay, so whenever you're interpreting any verse of the Bible, one of the questions you always have to answer is where does this fit with Genesis? How does it tie back to Genesis? And one of the things obviously here is the meter style that we're seeing hooking up with the text in very wry fashion. The meter style is also precedented in Genesis. So now when we come to the end, this is such a killer, and I didn't understand it until a few minutes ago. I've been trying to understand this for I don't know how many years now, five, six. See this right here? Okay. 1050? I thought it was 1144. It's 1141. This is such a killer. 1050 is the basic unit of time which survives in Judaism, which they like to call 7,000 years, but they're playing with it a little bit. It's 2,000 years. You can even Google on this. 2,000 years for the Goyim, 2,000 years for the Jews, then Messiah comes, then Messiah has his own 2,000, and then comes the millennium. That's how they get their 7,000 number. They think it's from the book of Enoch. It's not. It's from the Bible. And the Messiah 2,000 is what Matthew 24 and 25 covers. It covers the Messiah 2,000 plus the final 1,000. But it's not really a 1,000. They're rounding it off. It's 1,000 plus 50. Because the last 50 years after the 1,000 is called, from the Old Testament terms, harvesting of the Gentiles. So the last 50 of a 1050 year period, historically, is a period of intense evangelization of somebody who doesn't yet believe in God or doesn't yet believe in the biblical God. That's how history is designed. Now, that's a pretty fantastic claim. If that's really how history is designed, then we ought to be able to go through past history and find evidence of that. I'm not, you know, um, what do you want to call it? I own a business. This isn't my job. I'm not an academe by occupation. I do actuarial stuff, so I know a lot about numbers. But I'm not a scholar in the Bible. I'm also not a scholar in history. So I try to explain with what history I can find out. But you should be able, or you can find somebody else who's able, as a scholar, to know certain periods of history and see what they do. Okay? So that's why I really urge you to be skeptical. But, as you can see, if this claim is true, then it ought to be objectively verifiable. And of course, if it's objectively verifiable, it will be debated, especially since it's the Bible. But at least the plausibility of it could be established. So the argument here is that the basic civilization unit in Bible is 1050, 1050, 1050, 1050, 1050, 1050 a total of seven of them, including the millennium. Now the big kicker for me, and see this is where our chapter ends in English. We end it here at the 1050. All right, our Genesis 2:1 begins here, but in Hebrew, see this marker. That should be the chapter ending. It might not be because there's one here also. All right, it seems as though the chapter should end right here. At two, three. Now, if it does, this is such a killer. This is 91 years more. What does that mean? And the trouble is, is to explain this is really going to be a pistol. 
Moses is writing in the 1051st year of the flood. He has gone all the way back in time. He's constructing the Hebrew in a counting manner, in a syllable counting manner. So by the time he gets to the end of the chapter, he's gone full circle. And this also is the same dateline. This whole thing from the beginning. 63 sevens from. I'm 119 years old. It's also 210 years post. Noah's death and 490, which I have to explain. It's a very complicated thing, that number. It's also 364 years after Hammurabi started. It's also 378 years after Egypt's 12th dynasty ended. It's also 448 years after Jacob's death. It's also blah, 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 blah. Okay? So he's giving them a whole roster of dates as formulas for them to remember their own history. So by the time he gets here, he's still talking about how, where are we today when he writes. What is today's date? Well, it's, a pro, it's, it's X number of years after this, X number of years after that, Y number of years after that. And I don't know if you're familiar with Jewish culture, but that's how they do things. X number this, X number that. They make little songs out of it. I mean, I learned those songs as a kid, but I don't remember them off the top of my head now. But just talk to any Jew about number songs. They, they do this. This is how they, they study things. Six of this and five of that and three and two and five of this and seven of this and nine of that. Okay, I think there's some old Shelley Berman songs that have that in it. But just, you know, talk to any Jews you know about do you have any songs full of numbers? And they probably will tell you a bunch of them right off the top of their head. Okay? I remember there were a bunch of them at Passover, but I was so young then, I really don't remember how the songs go. Maybe I'll remember later, but right now I don't. So by the time you get down here, Moses is still saying today relative to N. I am N years from... This event in Israel's history, I am X years from this other event in Israel's history, blah, blah, blah. So he's come full circle still to his own date today when he writes. And he's writing at the beginning of the 1051st year after the flood. In other words, 1050 years have passed. So he's at the beginning of the new year. All right. Now this is where the equidistance come in, comes in and it's really sophisticated. When he writes, he's saying, I'm writing 1050 years after the flood ended and 1050 years from now, Messiah will be born. He's making the date of writing equidistant to a future number. And all the Bible books all of their datelines follow that same formula. You have equidistant from or just distant from, and then you have equidistant to or just distant to. Every Bible book in the New Testament using Greek instead of Hebrew does the same thing. I am writing you today X number of years from X event in the past that's really important to the text I'm writing. And the date that I'm writing you is also X number of X number of years until the millennium. In the New Testament, the marker is the millennium. Right here, the marker is when Messiah is supposed to be born. So, Messiah is supposed to be born another 1050 years after the flood. Now, why is that? Because it was 1050 years for the Goyim, and another 1050 years for the Goyim, and then the third 1050 was for the Jews. But Moses is writing at the end of that third 1050. So there's 1050 left until Messiah is to be born. Oh, but um, Messiah to be born. Well, then 
Israel, Jews, Messiah is born outside that 2100. Well, not exactly, because again, it's 1050, 1050, and the last 50 years is supposed to be, you know, an intense evangelization for the Jews. All right, and that's what's covered here. The Messiah period. But it's only covered, it's covered 91 years? What? Why 91? See, this is what, Daddy, but, but this 1050, so, so Messiah is to be born 1050 years from now. Yes, dear. But, but how come it goes to 91 years, Daddy? After that? But the 1050, 1050, 1050, 1050 is 4200, Daddy. So how can, how, how can, how can, um, how, how come there's 91 years after that? Why isn't it 100? Oh, well, see, son, at the time that Moses was writing, Messiah was supposed to be born 10, 50 years later. But the 91 means that it might not occur quite on time. There's some adjustment. There's like this mm, problem that's going to occur. Oh. Oh, yeah, I'm daddy. I remember because Psalm 90 did the same thing at the end of verse 17. That's right. And what was the problem? Um, that that Israel, Israel was going to have a problem building something, establishing with their hands. And it might not work. Right. And that's what Moses is reminding them of here. In other words, nine years of that hundred have a problem. And they might not play right. Oh. Now, leaving the child play out for a minute. What is this 91? 40 of it is the allotted time for Messiah. And of course it was a problem because he didn't end up living the full 40 years. If you take Daniel 9 and you use solar years, not lunar years, 483 years does not take you to 30 AD. It takes you to 37 AD. So, Messiah was allotted 40 years, and of course the Sanhedrin's 90 through 90, 97 through 99 records that. I found it out from, through some other way. I didn't know the Talmud had all this information at first. I just learned that a few years ago. So, that's part of it. Okay, but that leaves 51 years. Yeah, it's actually supposed to be 53.5 because Abraham... Abraham matured before he was supposed to. And he kind of had to mature when he did. See, here's here's Noah. Alright, here's the flood. And this link to this will be in the video description. Let me make it smaller. If you say, oh my God, Brainout, you've done so much stuff. Yeah, well, God did it. If it works, God did it. I'm totally amazed by it now, but at the time it was easy. Let me, I don't know why. It was easy then. Right now I'm freaking out about it. Here we go. Abraham super matures. He's age 100. And 2046 after Adam's fall. All these numbers are years after Adam's fall. B.C. and A.D. is in the left side. Years after Adam's fall is in the right side. And you get all this from just adding up the begats and going through other Bible verses. And the Bible verses that I used are in Brain Out Fact number 6A. Link to that will be in the video description. Well, 2046 is before 2100. See, he super matured right when Noah's personal 490 ran out. Which I'll have to explain in later videos why that's important. Abraham super matured. Oh, that's 54 years early. Yeah. But this 
is 51. 40 plus 51. Well, how come 51 and not 54 and a half? Well, that's another problem we'll get into later videos. David didn't exactly die on time. He died when he was 77. I mean, he died on time by God's timing. But the original schedule was that Christ would be born 4106 from Adam's fall, 2,000 years from Jacob's birth. But David had to live a little bit longer because Israel rebelled against God. Remember when David first became king at Hebron? They had a seven-year civil war. And that resulted in him becoming king over all Israel seven years later. So he lived seven years longer. Yeah, and then what happened instead of Solomon building the temple right away, he waited another three and a half years after David died, which he shouldn't have done. And that's in 1 Kings 6.1, which scholars routinely read wrong. Okay, David spent the last seven years of his life, 1 Chronicles 22 through 29, designing all the stuff for the temple. And 2 Samuel 5, God promised him, 2 Samuel 7 rather, God promised him when you're dead, then the temple will be built. Okay, but Solomon didn't quite start it right on time. So now... David living longer and the temple starting later since Christ is the temple the temple depicts he's got to be born earlier in order to be born on time so all this stuff that Moses is writing about will still occur on time but at the time Moses is writing it it was still potential that Christ will be born 2,000 years after Jacob's birth Therefore, 4106 from Adam's fall, and that's what we call B.C. In the Bible, whenever you're converting from B.C. to A.D., you take the number of elapsed Bible years from Adam's fall. 4106 is to Christ's scheduled birth, because the Bible hubs all of its dates that way. Christ, however, ended up being born three and a half years early. So when you're trying to hub to David's data, you have to subtract three and a half years. That's where we get, it's not the only reason we got that problem. It's very clever how this worked out in history. But that's how come we often say that Christ was born at the end of 4 BC. It just so happens that the Romans made the same mistake or I don't know if you want to call it mistake, but adjustment. Because in Varro's calendar, which is what all the Romans historians use, because it became law under Claudius, Varro made the same kind of error. Which implies that somewhere this calendar we're looking at here, and it's changeover, which is worn with three and a half years cut out, so that 53 and a half, be, well, not quite three and a half. So 53 and a half ends up becoming, instead of being 94, it's 91. Somehow that information got communicated to other peoples around the planet. Because when Varro makes his change, it's very famous. You can go to Livius.org today and see them talk about what kind of mistake Varro made. It's also... A three and a half year adjustment maybe four you know rounded and all that is warned about right here now at the end of that time that's when the Millennium was supposed to happen and Psalm 90 talks back to this section and this section and all the rest of Genesis 1 because it also starts with Adam Genesis means the origin of the man. Genesis is a Greek word. It's not Hebrew. It means the origin of the man. Well, the man, Adam, first Adam, last Adam, ha ha. That's what all this is about. So you'll notice that what you're being told here 
it's a little girl or a little boy memorizing the music. Oh, okay, so when Moses wrote, there was 1141 years left on the clock of history before the millennium would start. But, but it's like there's, there's years missing that we don't know anything about. It means that there's a problem. They might not play those extra nine years. Yeah, at the time Moses was writing, there might not have been a David. So then the whole time schedule is in some kind of problem, some kind of limbo. Yeah, and Psalm 90 answers that question, and I think that's what I'll end up covering next.